Well, 100 years ago, the women's suffrage movement was instrumental in getting women the right to vote. One of its leaders, Susan B. Anthony, was born right here in western Massachusetts. Steve Kiltonic went to her birthplace and has the story of her battle for the 19th Amendment. On August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, essentially providing men and women with equal voting rights. The amendment stated that the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The women's suffrage movement fought for 72 years before the passage of the landmark amendment. One of its pioneering leaders for over half a century was Susan B. Anthony. Anthony was born in this home, in this room in Adams, Massachusetts, which is recognized nationally as the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum. Extensively renovated 10 years ago, the museum is a testament to the suffragist icon who, along with her lifelong friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, founded the National Women's Suffrage Association. Susan B. Anthony was born on February 15, 1820, the second of eight children born to Daniel and Lucy Anthony. Susan was raised in the Quaker faith. The meeting house where she and her family worship still stands in the Maple Street Cemetery overlooking Adams. Cassandra Peltier is the executive director of the museum. One of the advantages of the Quaker community was that women and men were considered equal. Peltier said Anthony was influenced from an early age by women in her own family, like her paternal aunt Hannah, who was a Quaker preacher. And Quaker preachers were really community advisors, community leaders. So it was revolutionary for women to hold that position of power um, and, and respect, even in the 1700s. And on the maternal side of the family, Susan's grandmother basically ran the family farm while her husband was at war. So for different reasons, both sides of Susan's family showed her examples of strong, independent women who were considered equals with their husbands and um, encouraged to take leadership roles. Quakers opposed slavery and supported the abolition and temperance movements. Quakers believe that everyone has the same inner light connecting them to God, so at the most basic level, everyone is created equal. The Anthonys left Adams when Susan was six after her father received an offer to work at a mill in Battenville, New York. In her 20s, Susan became a teacher at Quaker schools in upstate New York. When the family relocated to Rochester, the epicenter of the abolition movement, she met its leaders, Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, for whom she wrote speeches. Anthony, however, became disillusioned. She realized that if she didn't work for women's political rights, any of the reforms that she was passionate about were basically useless for women to work because their voices would not be heard, they would not be taken seriously, and they couldn't vote. Scott Hartley teaches history courses on American government, social welfare policy, and human oppression at the Elms College. He said in the mid-1800s, women basically had no rights and were subservient to men who owned their property and money. The idea of women voting was seen as a challenge to the institution of marriage. They thought that, that, that women would stop wanting to, to be at home, uh, would stop wanting to be housekeepers, stop wanting to raise their children. Um, some, um, some people thought that women were too weak or not as intelligent. Or, you know, or not as sophisticated, that kind of thing. It was this whole idea of trying to keep women in their place. In 1851, Anthony's life dramatically changed course when she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton. In 1848, Stanton organized the Seneca Falls Convention, which is recognized as the beginning of the women's suffrage movement. Here, Stanton created the Women's Declaration of Rights, which claimed that all men and women are created equal, including the right to vote. Anthony of Stanton developed a lifelong partnership. According to Peltier, Stanton was seen as the philosopher of the movement, while Anthony, although a great organizer and public speaker, was terrible at composing speeches. She could speak extemporaneously and deliver wonderful speeches, but if she sat down to try and write it in advance, she had a very difficult time. And that's what Elizabeth Cady Stanton was very good at. Stanton had seven children and was married, so Susan traveled around the country giving as many as 100 speeches a year for the women's suffrage movement. They published a weekly women's rights newspaper, The Revolution, which advocated for equality of all races and genders. In 1869, they founded the National Women's Suffrage Association. Anthony was arrested for voting illegally in the 1872 presidential election and convicted in a widely publicized trial. 
she was fined $100 but never paid. In 1878, Anthony and Stanton presented Congress an amendment giving women the right to vote, but it was defeated. In 1890, after disagreement over the 15th Amendment, which granted black men the right to vote, Anthony's group merged with the American Women's Suffrage Association. Women of all backgrounds started to take up the cause. They worked at the state levels, and within six years, four western states granted women the right to vote. You know, there were sort of various degrees of voting, meaning in some states some women could vote, but it depended if they owned property or what kind of a job they had. As the new century approached, more states began to grant women the right to vote. Anthony and Stanton served as role models for younger women. One of the things that was really important for them was inspiring the next generation of women. Um, Susan B. Anthony was known as Aunt Susan to younger women who were in the suffrage movement. She was constantly writing back and forth with women in colleges, encouraging them to educate themselves on political processes. Neither Stanton or Anthony lived to see the 19th Amendment become law. Susan died on March 13, 1906, at 86. Neither one of them had any doubt that women would get the right to vote in the United States. It was just a matter of when. After her death, women began to picket and march more frequently in parades in cities like New York, Washington, and Philadelphia. So women were marching with their babies in strollers. They were walking their young children um, hand in hand. They had sort of uh, choruses of young girls um, performing or walking along in costume. The white dresses um, were a way to look more feminine since a lot of women who supported suffrage were seen as very masculine and threatening. As World War I began, legislatures in the House and Senate started to get more pressure from their constituents to enact a law. At the same time, the suffrage movement found an ally in President Woodrow Wilson. For him it was the war, you know, the World War I, and women's involvement in work. Um, and suddenly they, they were taking on kind of different roles and that it helped the overall, overall war effort, effort and that, um, okay, now they have a right to vote, you know, that, that they're, they're, they're equal to men. An amendment had to first pass Congress and then be ratified by three-quarters of the states. When New York became the first eastern state to pass a referendum, a domino effect took place. After Tennessee signed on as a 36th state, the 19th Amendment was made official on August 26, 1920. Over 8 million women voted for the first time in the presidential election that November. It took nearly four years and a million dollars to renovate the Anthony Birthplace Museum, which reopened its doors in 2010. Its five rooms take visitors through Anthony's early days in Adams through her many years as activist. The museum exists to preserve the property in the house and obviously the collection and just raise awareness about Susan B. Anthony's legacy. Um, even folks who live locally sometimes don't know that she was born here. What is Anthony's legacy? The majority of people I know, you know, look at her as a pioneer, look at her as someone who is ahead of her time, who had um, an unusual ability to see the big picture and then zoom in on you know, the, the little things that she could do to work towards the better future that she saw. Before COVID-19 hit, there were plans in Adams to honor Anthony with a parade and fireworks on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. While those plans are on hold, a statue of Anthony commissioned by the town is still under wraps on the town common. It features Anthony giving a speech, and at the bottom of the stairs is Susan as a child reading. The, the story is that she learned to read at the age of three. Um, and she was always precocious and trying to do all the things that girls weren't supposed to do. The statue is a fitting reminder of the crusading woman who fought so tirelessly and for so long on behalf of women's rights for the generations that followed. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic. The Anthony Museum has reopened to public tours with admission by online reservation only. We have a link at iobserve.org.